The next choice is the parietal lobe, and there we definitely see this is the location where that predominant alpha activity resides. It's in the mesial areas of the parietal lobe, and it's a little larger on the right. And this information would be visible on the raw EEG. When I show the raw EEG, if you were able to see these wave differences visually, you'd see, sure enough, P4 is just a little bit larger uh, than P3, generally. And with the eye, you would try and get this out of the waveforms, but with the Loretta display, we're able to show that information directly. In addition to the parietal lobe, there are sublobar uh, regions, which can be chosen. And then as we move down the menu, we finally have the temporal lobes. And again, we see that the activity that we're looking at is very little on the left posterior temporal lobe and a little bit larger on the right posterior temporal lobe. Now these uh, voxels, by the way, are five millimeters on an edge. That's the resolution of this. And the accuracy of the localization is estimated to be, be about two to three uh, voxels in terms of the actual accuracy. So the accuracy is 10 to 15 millimeters, which is um, uh, right around uh, less than half an inch up to about a half an inch resolution. Now after these lobes, we have different gyri. We have the fusiform gyrus, inferior temporal, middle temporal, superior temporal. Any of these can be chosen as regions of interest, visualized. And the list is rather extensive. Parahippocampal gyrus, orbital gyrus. There's the parahippocampal gyrus. This is in the mesial temporal area. Again, we see precisely the amount of activity. And if we want, we can add the brain displays and show how this activity relates to the brain. Maybe we'll just turn off the, um, here I did it the other way. I'll turn on this and not that, there. And now you have a very good view relative to one brain hemisphere of the activity in the parahippocampal gyrus. We then have orbital gyrus, rectal gyrus, subgyral, or inferior frontal. Now these are very important, obviously, with emotion and planning, the inferior frontal area. Very, very important um, in emotional processing, in reacting to stimuli, these types of things. And uh, superior frontal, inferior, middle, middle frontal lingual gyrus. And it's rather a long list. I'm not going to read every item on the list, uh, except to note that the anterior cingulate does appear. There's the anterior cingulate gyrus, and uh, it's very important. Here's the cuneus, and uh, posterior cingulate then, again, very important region. Again, confirming that the alpha activity we were seeing is predominantly parietal. Uh, here's the posterior cingulate, there's its involvement in that activity. And uh, again, the list is very, very extensive. It goes uh, rather long. And then we get into the Broadman areas. And the Broadman areas are numbered. So this, for example, would be Broadman area one uh, in the vicinity of motor processing um, and sensory information. Then we have Broadman area two. motor strip activity. Again, we see more activity on the right than the left. And the region of interest then can simply be continued down through all the Broadman areas uh, by number. And uh, uh, so there are a total of over 80 regions of interest that can be chosen uh, and trained uh, using the regions of interest. Now we're going to look at the palette controls in the live Loretta projector. And this is one area where we definitely seem to have some confusion and questions. Uh, and it's actually a simple concept, which um, I will explain. When we look at a three-dimensional image like this using color encoding, we need to define the levels at which the colors begin and the colors end, basically. So the beginning is defined as being very, very dark, um, and then being blue and lighter blue 
as you can see over here, for example, I'm seeing uh, alpha in this individual. And uh, as the colors then get larger, they move through green, and then they move up through yellow and orange and then become red. So basically, dark or blue means not very much, and red, orange, yellow mean a lot. So the question that we have to answer when we're doing this is exactly what do we mean when we say uh, not much or a lot. And this begins to touch on the idea of z-scores and normative ranges, but this is more of a display issue that we resolve. So the way it works is as follows. We have a uh, value called palette low, and palette low is the value of the variable, the current source density, that we decide will be black. And then we have one called palette high. You can see it's actually moving a little bit right now. Palette high is the variable, the value that we will call then red, be the top of the distribution. Now what I'm going to do is, right now we're using auto palette. And what auto palette does is automatically sets the low and the high so that they span the data. And we're guaranteed to have some black areas. And we're guaranteed to have some red areas in the data. And this is very common and it's quite useful. It's a way of auto scaling the data so that we can still see how it all compares uh, from one region to another. Because every voxel uses that one palette. Now I'm going to turn off auto palette right now. And now you'll see the signals are starting to um, move a little more slowly. And there we have a burst in the posterior and then it comes and then it might fade. And let me show what happens as we adjust the palette manually. If I take palette low, for example, and slide it down, what we see is a lot of the graph now becomes yellow and orange and red. And that's because the minimum value we have chosen is now very, very low and everything is above that value. Now if I slide palette low forward, which means to the right, now the graph begins to turn green, blue, and if I slide it far enough, I can actually get a lot of the voxels to turn black and disappear. And that's because I've set palette low at a high value. Now these are very useful to adjust. Suppose, for example, I want to know precisely where to pinpoint a source. If I adjust palette high in this case, or palette low, you'll see I can limit the amount of region which is being lit up to a very focal area. Now let's look at palette high. Palette high is the value which is red. So if I slide it over to the right, it makes it harder and harder to achieve red. In fact, none of the image is red when I slide palette high all the way over to the right. If I slide it to the left now, I'm going to begin to see some red. And if I just slide it a little bit, I am now able to pinpoint another focal area. If I slide it more to the left, eventually the whole head becomes red. So when you're viewing these live Loretta screens and you're seeing, for example, something that's all red or something that's all one color and it's not what you expect, then uh, what you're going to want to do is, first of all, see if your palette is adjusted in a manner that you're happy with or whether you're using auto palette. Now, I generally recommend using auto palette for viewing records. And you can still look at these um, uh, indicators and see where the readings uh, typically are. And when you use z-scores, uh, you will find that it's a lot easier just to use um, uh, manual setting and you can set the palette at one or two standard deviations. But again, if we go back to auto palette, we find that it will automatically set those values so that we're getting an optimal display of what's exactly going on at that time. Now I'm going to review translucence because sometimes that becomes an issue. Translucent tells where in the spectrum the voxels become translucent, which means you can see through them. So as I slide translucent to the left, I get a lot less visible. As I slide it to the right and I move it into the region of the palette, now I see that I'm getting good visibility. Um, so generally, you're going to want to adjust translucence 
um, somewhere in the middle of where your palette is in order to get good visibility. The one last control I want to review is damping. Damping slows down or speeds up the response of the display. For example, here I have damping turned all the way down. And when damping is turned all the way down, the signals are being analyzed in their raw form. That means that we're seeing the waveforms uh, instantaneously. If I turn up damping, you'll see that this change slows down and the signals eventually slow down to where the map is almost standing still. That means we're getting more of an average and that's useful for trending, but it does not give you the instantaneous information. So you're generally going to want a value of damping that's in between uh, the very fastest and the very slowest. So for example, uh, having it about one third of the way up is a practical way uh, to get a useful display for most purposes. I would like to explain briefly the use of Auto Palette, uh, how it's used. Right now on the display, you'll see that Auto Palette is not selected. Uh, and we've got a um, low and high palette values that are useful, so that at times we see red activity, at times we see blue. If we wish, it's possible to capture the uh, values by setting Auto Palette. And now you'll see the palette low and palette high selectors are actually sliding along in real time, uh, setting for values that they think are going to be optimal for us so that we can see the maximum amount of color in the display. The last button on the bottom right is called Set Now. The purpose of that button is allow you to capture the auto palette values and use them then as static values. It's sort of like using auto thresholding and then switching to manual thresholding. So for example, I will hit set now, right now. And now the palette will no longer change, but it will stay where it was set. So now you'll see that at times it's possible to have a lot of red on the screen or very little, mostly blue. There, for example, right there, you see there's a very relatively low amount of activity. So using set now is a good way to lock into a set of values that then would be compared uh, with uh, later as uh, the palette values so that uh, anything equal to or greater than that maximum is red and anything smaller uh, than the minimum is going to be turning black. One last thing I want to demonstrate, which some people will probably find very useful, is the fact that uh, you can show these live waveforms and the head map, for example, simultaneously if you choose. And the way that's done is by using the Overlay tab. The Overlay tab is the last tab on the right. It's actually tab number eight. And I'll click on Overlay. And what I see is right now that it's blank because there's nothing on the overlay screen. If I then go to my display menu and choose the acquired waveforms and place them on the overlay screen, now when I return to tab four, which is the head screen, I now have both the overlay waveforms and the head map simultaneous on this one um, display. So now I can see as I get alpha bursts like these right here, I can see the emergence in the Loretta map. And as I see other types of activity coming on screen on the right, that will be simultaneous with the live Loretta. So this is a very useful type of display, which allows you to see three-dimensional localization of brain activity simultaneous with either live or played back EEG recordings.